Hello to everyone. We are back. Welcome to season two of Campfire 365. As always, I'm your host, Carolyn Norton. First and foremost, I want to take a moment and sincerely thank everyone who tuned into season one, The Big Disaster. It was a huge success, and we truly hope the series helped organizations understand, plan for, possibly prevent, and even be prepared for any of the possible disasters that can crumble an organization. If you missed it, be sure to catch the replays and learn how to disaster-proof your organization. I'm so excited to kick off our second season of our podcast, Understanding Digital Transformation. In this highly anticipated season, we're going to take a look at how to bust the buzzword and understand what we keep hearing about. What exactly is digital transformation? Is it right for my organization? Where do I even start in this process? And what are the benefits for your organization? All these questions and much more are going to be covered throughout the season. Now on to our first episode. At the heart of a company's digital transformation are the people who are impacted. Today, I'm sitting down with our client, Andrew Ho, head of IT at Global Strategy Group, and a cohort of technology experts as we relive GSG's journey from start to finish. With pragmatic insights from the clients and consultants, we'll be covering multiple perspectives of GSG's transformation journey, including the highs and the lows. With that being said, let's jump into our first episode, Digital Transformation, a Retrospective with Global Strategy Group. Welcome everyone. We're here today to talk about digital transformation. What does it mean and how does it help your organization? Many have discussed this topic in general terms, but we wanted to highlight GSG's transformation journey. And so we have a panel of speakers today to talk about that experience. I'm your host, Carolyn Norton. I'm the Cloud Director of Engineering and Operations here at Velocio. I'm Andy. I am Andy Ho. I am the head of IT and office services at Global Strategy Group, or GSG. So I guess I'm the guest here. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get to more details <laughs> as we talk. Hi, I'm Lorna Link, and I am the BC Express Practice Director at Velocio, and I had the great pleasure of working with Andy and his team. Hey there, my name is Raihan Gill. I'm the Director of Digital Transformation, uh, our new advisory services practice here at Colossio, uh, where we provide, you know, proactive advisory services, more detailed in discovery cycle to create really a robust and concrete foundation for our clients to uh, ease them into a uh, transformative process and transition from legacy technologies over to our newer age modern based technologies in the Microsoft tech stack. Hi, my name's Erica Ellis, and I'm a principal consultant at Velocio on the uh, Dynamics customer engagement team. And I actually helped uh, Global Strategy Group implement Dynamics in their organization. Amazing, amazing group of people here that have worked with TSG in their journey. So Andy, let's set the table here. Let's talk about when you came into GSG what was the environment like? What did it look like? What was the technology landscape? What What did you come into when you became a part of the GSG family? Sure. So when I started at GSG, it was like the summer. It was the summer of 2015, um, and surprisingly, at least to me at the time, was that um, GSG had been in business already for 20 years by the time I got there. But when I got there, I was their first full-time IT hire ever. Uh, they had mainly just depended upon like a mix of like their office manager, finance, and there was like a part-time uh, like consultant CIO that was helping out um, prior prior to me getting there, and also an MSP that did tech support, uh, an off an, an, an offsite MSP that was doing tech support for it. But everything was still, from a tech perspective, very much a mom and pop shop like. Most of the laptops weren't his purchased through a business account. They like it was like the office manager literally running to Best Buy and buying buying laptops for people. It seemed like 
um, you know, when they started. Um, it was, a, you know, they had, just before I'd gotten there, the, they, they did migrate everyone to Office 365 and then brought some level of consistency in regards to the productivity suite and email. But it was still like a mix of like shared drives, shared network drives, where like file storage, as well as different people using different things. So some people were using Dropbox, one you know, OneDrive, um, SharePoint, you know, you name it. Someone was probably using it at that point. So there was not much standardization to to that. Um, from like an internal st system standpoint, the the firm had been using Salesforce for some time for for CRM. But ironically, they had modified um, Salesforce so heavily to handle how GSG does their business, which I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, but um, so that it not only was a CRM system, they had modified Salesforce to the point where it was also many ways a uh, PSA or professional services automation system. And through that, they, they use Salesforce as a timesheet system to track people's hours to these projects. And it had gotten to the point that when I got there and people knew that, I, you know, the employees that were there knew I was going to be taking over Salesforce. They were like, oh, you know, so you're going to take over our timesheet system. And I was like, oh, what's your timesheet system? They're like, Salesforce. And I'm like, you realize that outside of these four walls, you're not going to find a single person that refers to Salesforce as a timesheet system. Like no one thinks about Salesforce. <laughs> um, and people would just be like, really? You know, people, like they were floored that. Like they just assumed everyone, if everyone used timesheets, they would use Salesforce. And I was just like, and meanwhile, I'm like, no, 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 you guys are an anomaly. <laughs> um, so it was sort of that atmosphere. There was, you know, it was, and you know, with, with different things, not, you know, in this case of Salesforce not being used properly or things that were just a little more scattershot. And the firm knew this and they, they and the reason they brought me in was because they knew it was time to professionalize, to put structure, have a real IT strategy and a plan moving forward and to move the firm forward um, and embracing technology and so forth the, that the firm is not going to grow um, and not be competitive if it if it stayed in the, in the current state it was when I got there. Um, and so I didn't explain what GSG does for everyone, um, everyone that doesn't know or hasn't taken the time to Google this. Um, so Global Strategy Group is a political research, a democratic political research firm, as well as a communications and public affairs firm. Um, so we focus on on supporting, you know, politicians at the at the national to state level um, across the country on the democratic spectrum as well as working with corporations and with nonprofits on on the various causes and public affairs um, um, drives that, that they're looking for. Uh, and so in many ways, it's we are very much like a consulting firm in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, you know, our, our staff are our resources. Um, you know, we, we get projects, uh, whether it's a polling or whether it is building out a communication strategy or a public affairs plan. And you know we bill hours to it, you know, just like any other consulting firm you would expect to. Sometimes it's fixed price, sometimes part per hour, and so forth. But that's the type of business that we do. That that's really great insight to a who GSG was and is, and and what challenges we were facing. And it sounds like you were the organization knew of these challenges. They brought you in once they started to understand uh, where the organization could use some, it, it seems like some strategic guidance. How did you come up with what business outcomes you were trying to achieve and what to tackle in terms of focusing on those challenges? Yeah, the first areas that I tackled were things that I saw as immediate pain points. And one of the biggest ones was, was file management because they were still on network drives and they had already by the time I got there they had already run out of server space um, and my predecessor who left in a in a bit of mysterious circumstances like he literally just ghosted and never came back um, had set up <laughs> in a, a challenge <laughs> yeah. uh, well and that leads to the story is that he had set up an uh, an Azure site that had moved a lot of the art and archived a lot of documents to it but he never left the password for it or anything <laughs> for anyone. And so one of my first challenges was trying to guess and decipher what he could have used as a password. 
Um, fortunately, our MSP was pretty handy in this, and fortunately, he didn't have the best um, password, uh, you know, password standards in regards to or pa password like best practices. Um, it so, it's not, but it worked in your favor. <laughs> but it worked incredibly well in his favor because, yeah, in this day and age, I, you know, you get shot if you <laughs> you did some of the things. But I mean, again, there's a reason why there was a reason why they were they brought me in too um but we were able to figure it out and it was a concern because because of the network drives and because some of it was archived in a place that was temporarily unaccessible to until we inaccessible till we got to it um and also uh, as for anyone that recalls back in the day of network drives and everything being localized is the only way you can access it is through vpn and VPNs, especially back in 2015, I can't believe I just said that, um, it, you know, it can be very slow and cumbersome. And so, you know, our, the staff just complained, like, you know, we were running out of space for, for files, things were hard to find when they work from home or anywhere else, it was incredibly slow. And so that became my first, you know, one of the you know, immediate areas, you know, we got to fix that because like, I'm not, we're not going to see the end of the year. If, you know, that's what it felt like. We're not going to see the end of the year unless this got fixed. Um, so that was one. The Salesforce one was a big issue because we were using it as a CRM and a PSA. Salesforce, as hopefully everyone here knows, is not designed to be a PSA. Um, and it, it had been in many ways cobbled together and Frankenstein into becoming one. And it was, and all of that custom development was showing, you know, showing the cracks at this point. And the, in, the initial plan was figure out how to stabilize it and get it to work better. There was never a plan of like move off of Salesforce, um, you know, so worked with Salesforce, signed a, I think it was a two, two year or three year deal at the time to, you know, to lock in our, our licensing costs. And we're going to, all right, we're going to dig in and figure this out and get Salesforce to work. So that was another priority. And then some of the other priorities we tackled were like, like hardware infrastructure related within the offices. Um, we also tackle um, a need for more instantaneous communications. Um, you know, like constant emailing was driving a lot of people, certain people nuts or, and a number of people nuts where you get like one word email responses and then you jump into a thread or get into a thread and it's like, you have no idea because you know, <laughs> yeah, people reply to different parts of the thread and then you have like all these conversation threads and so forth. Uh, this was back when Microsoft still, well, they still have it, but they, they were running Yammer as their, their main um, source of that. And Yammer was, was people did not like Yammer at all. Um, and so there were, you know, folks wanted something that, you know, that bridged that gap. So I think those were probably the big three things that, that was there when I got there. Um, well, I, I think I, I heard, um user experience was definitely a challenge factor that you wanted to yeah. tackle. Right. So user um, experience was one. Well, actually, that user experience was a huge one that I that that both I wanted to tackle and personally wanted to focus on um, as my sort of IT strategy. Like most of my IT is very more people focused and process focused than it is really on on straight technology focused. Um, the other example I can give too that I focused on was with our MSP, and I think I've told some of you the story in in, in previous conversations. But like when I, when I got to GSG and I started talking with staff and I started learning about all the different tech issues people were having, like this doesn't work, that doesn't work. You know, someone was working with like a keyboard where like half the keys didn't work and that they would use another keyboard, like all sorts of craziness. And I'd be like, why wouldn't you raise it to the tech support? And they're like, oh, there's such a pain to deal with. You have to open a ticket and then they get back to you after so much time and there's all this back and forth. So we're just like, whatever. So they don't really contact tech support unless they're, they literally cannot could not work anymore. And then I have my, you know, intro conversation with the tech support firm and I talk with them and they come in and they're like, you know, you are our favorite customer. You're our best customer. You guys never have any issues. And I'm like, interesting you say that. <laughs> Little do you know. <laughs> You're not wrong in this, or rather it's not so much that we don't have any issues. We don't open very many tickets and that's where we want to dig into. So. We worked with them and, and one of the key changes at the start with is we started having on-site tech support, um, not having someone on site. There's like a, I've, you know, quickly discovered there is a mental barrier to raising tickets when you're, when you have to force someone to email or call if they have to open a ticket of some sort 
if there is someone literally sitting there that you can walk up to, you're going to walk up to them and, and talk to them um, about something versus, you know, if you had to open a ticket, you'll just not say anything. Most people just won't say anything. Um, and so that immediately, you know, move that away. And in, in my philosophy, off, oftentimes with tech support is I actually hate metrics that talk about like, you know, this is the number of tickets we had, number of tickets solved, because it it's like that old Dilbert like incentives of, you know, you just want to increase the amount of tickets and solve the tickets, but it doesn't measure customer satisfaction and is whether or not everything is working the way it should. And I wanted to focus on are our staff happy? Can do they have everything they need to work and are they happy with how long it took to, to resolve it or how quickly it resolved it? Um, so that, that's, that's a great thing to your point, Carolyn, is that that was, you know, that was a large part of my focus was like, let's get everyone working and happy about what, you know, what they're working with. And it sounds like you weren't, you didn't come in gun ho. You, you got that, uh, you have that end user experience to focus on, but you initially went in saying, all right, let's see, let's work with what we have. Let's see what we can do in the organization at some point when did you recognize that perhaps there might be other solutions that need to be in contention with what you have today it, it, it what other options are available beyond what you have today oh pretty much immediately like as soon as it, like recognizing that there, these were issues like you know my brain already starts spinning as to like what are the possibilities um like, like for example, like with file storage, right? So it's like you you you, you spot the issue and immediately like, okay, we you know out of the box because we had already the firm had already moved to Office 365. Like, so what's wrong with OneDrive? What's wrong with you know SharePoint? What have we done so far? And digging into that and discovering that people hated both SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, personally, I hate SharePoint anyway, but I was happy to discover that no one there liked it either. But no one liked OneDrive either. In fact, despite the fact that um, the firm had pushed Office 365 and everyone seemed to embrace it almost immediately, the one part of uh, the one piece of Office that only like four or five people jumped into was OneDrive. Almost so, almost universally, the firm took a one look at OneDrive and was like, "Yeah, never mind. <laughs> we're going to keep doing what we were doing before." Um, and you know, in so in so for some cases, it was I'd rather deal with all the problems of the net, network drive than than move to OneDrive. Um, for others who wanted more of the convenience of having like the you know the web experience, the cloud, the shared, and everything else, they would just move to Google Drive, their personal Google Drive or Dropbox, um, because they were familiar that with with you know their personal files, and they were like, yeah, we'll just use that. That's simpler. Um, which is your experience, you're also contending with adoption and making right. sure that your what you're providing right. as a solution is actually going to get adopted by your end users. As oh, hundred well. percent. Yeah, because if your end users don't adopt what you put together, then you might you've just wasted a ton of money. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like, it doesn't matter how great you think your solution is, or how efficient it is, or how much money you're going to save. If your end users don't adopt it or you spend a ton of money forcing them to adopt it, like, you know, squishing like a round peg into a square hole, it's not it's not going to work. The The best systems are the ones that your users immediately gravitate toward um, and start using and, and, and leveraging it as quickly as possible. And if you can't get to that point, you know, if you can't if you can't build up to that point, then you're you're, you're wasting your time and money in many ways. You're like, you, need, you need to that's what you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and for mm -hmm. us, uh, it, you know, like the solutions that we adopted, for example, for like file management, which is Box ultimately, um, and even for like messaging, we ended up going with Slack, are two perfect examples where adoption was near immediate. I mean, Slack was like, to, to this day, we moved our entire firm to Slack and it is singularly the most organic easy migration adoption I've ever done in my entire career. Like it was literally like Slack's available and people are already like posting giffies and emojis and the all sorts of channels are being built and people are already coming up with structures. So it's like, okay, that was easy. My work is done. <laughs> it was, it, you know, it, it was like opening a toy box and everyone instantly knew how to use it. Like opening or opening a box of Legos and everyone knows, you know, what to do next. That's a, that's a perfect analogy, right? If a kid doesn't want to play with the toy, off to the corner it goes. Yep. So how 
how did um, Velocio uh, get introduced with GSG? Where in this journey? It sounds like, again, you had this strong focus on end user experience. You recognize that there was adoption opportunities or reassessments. You mentioned other solutions in your organization that you recognize. Again, there, there is an area of opportunity here to help your organization. How did Velocio get in the mix and how did that relationship start? So the, how Velocio got into this mix actually st comes back to, to Salesforce, our old friend Salesforce. So <laughs> like I mentioned, my initial intent was to figure out how to get Salesforce to work and we bought ourselves time with locking and everything. And we spent two years like truly giving it the absolute college try of getting Salesforce to work and meet all the requirements that we had. But one of the biggest challenges that we have as GSG in regards to how we feel a CRM should work is how we measure our, our, our opportunities, our business, and how we reward people for bringing in business to, to the firm. Because um, for starters at GSG, we don't have dedicated salespeople. So we, there's not a sales team that, that you know, works leads, brings in, brings, in, um, brings in sales, and then transfers it over to a project team. Um, our partners, our senior VPs, you know, they're the ones, and, and, and senior directors and so forth, they're the ones that go out and, and bring in the business. And the way we measure this is like a typical CRM, like out of the box, you know, opportunities come in, you start tracking it. And then the moment the opportunity becomes like, you know, sold one, you close the opportunity and that's the, that's the end of that. And then the person that brought it in gets credit for that, that win. At GSG, the credit doesn't actually get allocated at the moment the, um, the opportunity closes, closes as one. We continue tracking what happens after that opportunity, like what projects are spun off that opportunity. Oftentimes it's one-to-one -one opportunity closes, it spawns one project, but sometimes it can be more than one project. And then we want to track what happens to those projects and are those projects completed to, you know, and all the revenue has been recognized from those projects because our people don't get full credit for the sale until all the revenue is recognized at the end of the project. Um, which is why this PSA piece is so important to us and why like timesheets and everything else was very important to us is because um, it's only you're, you've only done half your job if you get the client in the door. You don't do your full job until you fully satisfy the client and they've paid you and, and finances recognize that money. Um, and until that magical moment, you know, you're not done yet, um, in essence. So, you know, so we had cobbled Salesforce to continue tracking the work beyond the typical, you know, one close piece um, through that. And that was the part that was was really as the year was went as the one year went by and the second year went by, it was really starting to show all the cracks of a custom development that didn't take into account like a business that was evolving and different things. And we recognized that it was gonna in essence, we couldn't, we can no longer like modify our way out of the hole that it was in. We, if we were going to stay with Salesforce, we, we were going to have to start from scratch with in essence, a fresh instance of Salesforce and build from that. And the idea from there was, um, not to build something custom like we did previously, but to leverage one of Salesforce's partners that does PSA. Um, and build it together in a way that would meet all of our business requirements. So even up to this point, our goal was pure Salesforce, but recognizing that, you know, it was going to be much broader and more expensive to, to do. We're looking for a more total solution for GSG, yeah. right? Not necessarily, here's the product and let's see if it works for the org. You really wanted to approach it as, is this, is the current solution, whether it's Salesforce or not, going yep. to meet? the nuances of GSG as you highlighted earlier. Yep, so 100%. You really thought Microsoft, how did that how did that happen? So it happened, well, it didn't happen. It didn't I didn't immediately think Microsoft either. It's it's it's, it's uh, it, so what happened really quickly was that I went back to Salesforce explaining what the situation was and wanting to see if they can extend our licensing costs at the same rate. And they basically told us they basically for all intents and purposes, laughed, told us, yeah, that's funny. Um, we're gonna increase your, we plan to increase your licensing costs by 7%. Um, and that the only way we would prevent that is if we just bought more licenses or spent more money on Salesforce. Um, but in essence, they were like, you need to spend way more money on us. Um, and there was a, definitely a, a strong 
undertone of arrogance because they were clearly not expecting us to do anything else but spend all that money on them. Um, but the only, the fortunate piece was that for us, I had entered that discussion in the second of our third, you know, before our third year of our contract. So we had one year. So after that discussion, I was like, we're done. <laughs> you know, I, you know, internally told, talked with GS, all the folks in GSG is like, we're done with Salesforce. Basically, this is what they, they are saying. We have one year to switch because if we don't, we're paying 7%. Here's the amount that we have to pay just to, just to, just to stay in the game. And that was when I started doing a search of, okay, what are all the replacements for Salesforce, for a firm of our size, which was at the time just under 100 staff members. Um, so about 100, you know, just about 100 license or 80 licenses at the time, um, be able to do CRM, PSA, so forth. And pulled in a bunch of different folks from NetSuite to Microsoft Dynamics to Zoho to a bunch of boutique ones that, um, you know, of various names and so forth across the board and just started reaching out to them. For Microsoft, because I didn't know anyone that did Dynamics at that time, I literally just went on to, you know, to the Microsoft form, filled it out, said, I'm interested in Dynamics. Um, and I got connected with a, a person I still keep in touch with at Microsoft, who was fantastic because he reached out and was like, and we got into a whole conversation, explained the whole situation. And he was like, I have the perfect, I think I have the perfect firm for you, um, from our partners. And he's like, I'm going to go check with, and, and come back. And he came back and it was, you know, what Velocio was at the time, which was Socius. And it was like, this is the firm they're based, you know, they're, they're based in Columbus, Ohio. I think they will, I think they're a perfect fit for who you guys are and what you guys want to do. Um, so from there, he just put us, put me in touch with, um, with Socius, um, now Velocio and, and the rest is literally history from there. Um, so, but that's, that's how I got to you guys into Microsoft. And from there, you guys were, and I, like Microsoft basically anointed you guys the, their, their champion for, for this fight, right? Cause, um, even then I wasn't like in my head, like we're definitely going Microsoft, like at all, like just. That was going to be my next question. All right. You have your different options here. Right. Here. Again, you have, uh, all the, the menu is yours. You can choose yep. what you want to go with what led you down this particular solution um, as it relates to, again, what you're facing. And what I love, Andy, is that you gave it the college try, you identified the user impact to the organization. Obviously the organization recognized challenges. Um, and then you didn't wait till that end of the contract with Salesforce. You started investigating, again, that college try that you mentioned earlier, what more can you do with the solution and recognized early on all right we need to make a, a serious decision on our challenge here otherwise we're kind of stuck again and 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 we have an increase in our <laughs> in our overall cost so you know and and i and i and i call that out because very often organizations kind of wait very close to the end and then it becomes a rush um yep. for them to really pick a solution, make sure it's right for them, force the users to, you know, get onto it quickly, which is again, adoption super important. Um, and there may not be, sometimes there's positive results, but sometimes there are not results, good results. So again, yeah. just calling out the timeline was, is very interesting for you guys. Cause it seems to have worked out. It, well, yeah. And part of that was like very care. Like we, I had, we, I had a very specific end date, like literally just marked on the calendar. This is when our Salesforce licenses end. And then working <laughs> backwards from that, it was like, that means that we have to have been migrated off of Salesforce by like, by this point or we're screwed. And then just <laughs> and then again, working backwards from there, paying, you know, knowing that means requirements need to be here. This means, you know, all these things all the way backwards. No, that's um, amazing. That's great stuff. And then, and then to your, your original question, so yeah, so we, we we lined up all of our horses and and to be perfectly blunt, I was never expecting Microsoft to win this, like ever. Like, so prior to even coming to GSG, like I've had experience with, a lot of experience with Salesforce. I'd worked with SAP, I've worked with Siebel back when Siebel was the thing before Oracle got bought. I was actually expecting like potentially NetSuite to work its way out or maybe even one of the boutique ones. Um, there's also one um, Sugar CRM that I thought might you know, might be in intriguing as well um, because I had heard great, great things about it. But Microsoft had never entered the, entered the equation in my head, like when I first started this, because I was like, Microsoft, because 
in some ways, Microsoft, like with Office, is like, you know, makes things super easy. But I always joke with everyone is that Microsoft has this stunning ability to make something both incredibly easy and incredibly complex, often at the exact same moment. Um, they, they are, they can, they're frustrating in that, that, that there are some things that can be super easy. And then like you flip to the admin console and you're like, what the heck is going on? Like, why is this thing such a mess? <laughs> um, and so, and it carries over across everything <laughs> that they do. So long story short, didn't expect it, but your team did a great job in presenting Microsoft and demonstrating how Dynamics had out of the box, had both the ability to do CRM and PSA, um, which which helped make it fairly unique amongst all the different um, systems that we were looking at. The majority of the ones that we looked at required like some level of custom development to create the PSA. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we really did not want to go down that path after our experience with Salesforce of custom developing. Yep. And others like NetSuite at the time required us like, yes, they were like, oh yeah, we can do PSA, we can do CRM, but they're like, we don't do implementations unless you first change your ERP to us. And we're like, yes, we plan on changing our ERP, but we have to change our CRM because again, the timeline of when Salesforce is going to end and we don't have the time or energy to replace ERP first to do and then do CRM. And so NetSuite took themselves out because they're like, we won't work with you unless you change your ERP first. Um, and so we're like, okay, thanks. Um, and so, and so long and short of it, you know, Microsoft, um, Sugar CRM and the in a very boutique company were, were the three finalists amongst this. And after like final presentations and going through everything, you know, it was basically down to Microsoft and Sugar CRM and the pros and cons of the two were almost diametrically opposed because the pros of Microsoft was CRM PSA right out of the box. But the cons is that it was, you know, from the demos and everything else, people felt it was clunky. There was a lot of clunkiness to how Microsoft worked. Um, and there were definitely things that were like, yeah, Microsoft says do this, but we don't really do that. Um, or we don't do the And but they love the fact that they could see the clear, you know, the clear parts that were, that were already built in in place, um, that one didn't have to be custom developed and sugar CRM, you know, presented something that was very, you know, very streamlined, um, and very pretty. Um, and also it was, you know, customizable because it was built like on, you know, in essence on Drupal, but, um, but we knew we had to custom build the PSA. And at the end of the day, the decision was, we do not want to custom build anything. And so Microsoft went out uh, on this. And so then we went out to, to Microsoft and we got introduced to Erica and, um, and then the timeline began of, all right, now, now we've decided on this, we've got to get started and, and build this out. Erica, based on, based on everything Andy has said, how has Velocio, you know, uh, taken dynamic CE, uh, CRM, um, and help that solution meet GSG's needs? How were we able to do that? Yeah. So going back to what Andy said about out of the box PSA, had all of the functionality that they needed, but it also had more that they didn't need. It just didn't meet their uh, business requirements. And But unfortunately, the system, we could configure it to smooth over those parts, right? So we were able to sit down and say, okay, we have this great solution out of the box. What can we do to improve the user experience and make it as easy as possible for them? The users at GSG, it's a very hardworking, busy group of people. So they needed things to be fast, easy to use, all of that good stuff. So we sat down and figured out what that flow looked like and used the simple configuration tools within PSA and Dynamics to smooth those edges out and keep that um, user experience as quick and simple as possible. Amazing. Now. Uh, so that helped with the aggressive timeline of, uh oh, we got to get off of Slack as soon as possible. I also know that at some point there was a decision to go into Dynamics BC, which is another Dynamics family that Microsoft yep. has. How did that come about? So, well, that was so 
the idea that we needed to change our ERP was always in 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 the back of our heads um, because. Besides Salesforce, we were also on the ERP, and ERP is a very generous term for this, like an accounting system that we were using um, was called, it was Sage 50, which um, for those familiar from back in the day was just Peachtree. So in essence, it's a it's an accounting software that back in the day you would buy out of a box from Best Buy and, and use it for your your mom and pop shop to, to do your, your, you know, your small business accounting needs that at this point, GSG had long since outgrown, but the and knew that we had to move on to a um, to a better, more robust system. But unlike Salesforce, Sage 50 is fairly inexpensive, and unlike Salesforce and in, in the way it was falling apart, Sales, Sage 50 wasn't necessarily falling apart. Yes, it didn't have all the the you know the full controls that a medium-sized firm needs, or um, yes, there are certain things that are clunky and, and don't work that great, or there are certain limitations. But at the end of the day, you know, you know, invoices are being sent, things, revenues being recognized, the GLs being, you know, all that work. It got the job done. So, right. It got the job done. So it was not the priority to start until until we had our CRM fixed. Um, and then once that was done, that was then we were like, okay, we need to replace Sage, Sage 50. Um, and the other thing I want to say before we jump down the BC side too, just in regards to just the, the, the accelerated timeline, I want to point out that Eric and her team, we actually finished the project early. So like I said, we, um, in the sense that we had it was the end of September to switch from like was when um, Salesforce's um, licenses ended. We finished before the summer, like right before the summer, I want to say like right after Memorial Day, June, the project was technically done. And we made a decision to delay the, the delay the user rollout because summer vacations had started kicking in, and we were like, we need people back in the like everyone back in the office. Um, we can't roll out a system that everyone uses while everyone half the firm is going to be on vacation. Um, and so, so yeah, so we actually finished the project early and intentionally delayed rollout for about two months um, to um, to what wait till everyone came back. <laughs> So, so we we didn't roll it out to right the week after Labor Day. We're like, we give everyone to Labor Day, and then they come back, they get back in back into the groove, and then we're going to 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 force migrate everyone at that point. So that leads me to a a, a really a uh, question. We talked about user experience again. The timeline is working out amazing. Right. How did how did you guys help end user adoption? How did you get the buy-in from the users that the solution, you know, again, we talked about it earlier, you're picking a solution, everything seems to be the right fit for GSG. How did you get their buy-in? How did you get leadership buy-in? And how did the adoption get rolled out? So buy-in started from leadership from the very beginning, from the moment we decided that, like from the decision that we were leaving Salesforce and going with someone else, it had to be bought in from from our most senior leadership and so i report to our managing partner and our managing partner and i were adamant that we would get full buy-in across the board and he made a special point that he was going to make them sign like something just to like just for somewhat for the show of it but also something that he's just like i want them to realize the seriousness that there's no backing out no pointing fingers afterwards or anything else that you are bought in and at that point forward, you were going to do nothing else but support that this is going to work. So the decision to leave Salesforce, the decision to move to Microsoft, and then um, the decision of like rollout and everything else that, um, you know, they were, you know, fully bought into it from the beginning. So it was very top down. You never, I never had a fight up to be able to, to convince someone or, you know, reword how something is positioned or anything else it was this is what we're doing um yes we would have discussions and back and forth and some things may change but the bottom like our plan was bought in from the top down to me and then from there it was sort of multi-pronged i would present um in staff meetings through emails through slack like what we were doing what are the next steps what to expect and the from senior leadership to the practice managers down they would reinforce that and ensure that people were complying. And there were obviously people that would be like, oh yeah, whatever. 
and then they would get feedback from you know from their business side that no this is not a what forever whatever you do need to listen to this you do need to follow this so it was very helpful in keeping it structured so folks knew that like we were planning we were like we had told them at the beginning of summer that you know we didn't necessarily say oh we're done and ready but we were just like we're going to roll this out at you know the week after labor day this is what you need to prepare for. Um, and, you know, people are going in and out of vacations and we would occasionally remind folks. Um, internally, like we started doing the migration near the end, like end of August, like we started our work. Like, it's not like we waited till after Labor Day to start our work internally, but like, so end of summer, we you know, basically fired everything back up again, um, started getting everything ready, started doing like the initial prep for the migration and all that. You know, we got our, like right around Labor Day, we, you know, I had an all, I presented an all to all staff again, what we were doing. We had like our internal team had already like user U UAT the whole thing. And we had, we, we basically spl split them up to sit with different users. Like, you know, folks would travel to different offices to make sure that, uh, you know, the week of rollout, we had a very clear timeline of, you know, like Monday you're in Salesforce, Tuesday you're in Salesforce. At the end of 5 p.m., if it's not in Salesforce, it's not going in, period. Like, that's it. You're stopped. Um, system's <laughs> locked. Write that, whatever it is that you think you need that in there, write it on, you know, type it into Word, write it on note thing. It's not going into a system until this time on, or whether it was like Thursday or Friday, but like whatever time it was, it, you know, it, was, it wasn't going in until, you know, the, until Dynamics went live on the on the following week. So well, it wasn't the end of the week, but the following week. Um, and so people had very clear guidelines of, of what they were to do and, and stuff. And people were getting up, like, you know, excited or at least talking about it. Like, oh my God, yeah, it's like, you know, ha ha ha, I don't, I, I get off and put this in today or whatever. Um, so folks knew and then the day, day came and, and folks got in and yeah, there were hiccups, but it was nothing, nothing that egregious, right, Erica? Like, I don't remember, like, nothing stands out in my mind as particularly egregious or like nothing blew up, you know, or, or I, I still want to say knock on wood, but it's like so many years ago. It's nothing. <laughs> we're safe now. <laughs> it's, also, it's really all safe now. But, um, but yeah, nothing, nothing bad, nothing truly bad happened. Like, they, and, and a lot of the stuff was people just getting used to the new UI. Um, but yeah, it, it, it worked as smooth as can be, um, as you could ask for, 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 you know, all a firm wide system out of this nature. Um, it yeah. was, it was, I think, I think it's a testament, especially to how well you planned, you know, your, your strategic, you know, output overall, and then you put them at the forefront of everything and you focused on change management and adoption at the start. I think that's really important in a digital transformation, you know, cycle is to, kick started off right away with change management, not leave it till the last, you know, day after UAT and then training, you know, everybody else to get off the system. Uh, it's I mean, starting early, right? Starting yeah, early and continuing the process, Andy, because even when you went through the CRM process, once you moved into BC, you didn't back off. You right. got your whole financial team involved and you oh, were yeah. there. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> And again, these, these two uh, implementations didn't happen at the same time, right? They were one after the other. Did your users experience, you know, change fatigue? Oh my gosh, we just, you know, learned dynamics. You're doing this again for us? Is, you know, how did that get translated as you moved over to the new project? Yes and, and it, no. Was between? Um, it wasn't too bad. Well, we spent, after we went live, we spent another nine months um, refining Dynamics. So we had another, like we had queued up a lot of stuff that had not made the cut, so to speak, um, to just to make sure we hit our go live um, for, you know, the for transition. Right. And, and there's also things that we discovered as people started actually using the system. Of course, my boss decides he wants to call me right now. Um, <laughs> Um, that, um, that, you know, as people were using it, we discovered there, you know, certain things that were still clunky that we could, that we can streamline out or things that we thought we were going to use that we were no longer using and things that we were like, oh, we'll never touch that. And like, oh, I think we need that back. <laughs> um, so, so after go live, it, we, we ended up having like a smaller, like, like a, like a couple months later, we did like a little, like almost like a point release. And then we had a much larger update to just how we use Dynamics um, done, I think six or so months afterwards. So after like about nine months, 
we got dynamics more or less to the place that we're at now like we've done some tweaks here and there um but there hasn't we haven't done like a massive change to how we use dynamics since um you know since those initial set of releases so, so that, was, that was out, and then you did a pulse check it sounds right. like okay yeah. and so we still during all that we still didn't touch erp because to your um to your point there was fatigue in regards to like our finance team was like <laughs> we're getting used to this to we're not we're, we're not touching it um so but once crm you know some um, steadied itself then our finance team was like okay let, let's start thinking through this but in between that um before we started fully looking at it we started looking at power bi as well um for reporting because the rec part of the part of the recognition as we were doing crm was out of the box dynamics reporting you know, it's basically spreadsheets. They're basically glorified spreadsheets with some tables and stuff. Um, and there's a lot more in-depth analytics that our, our internal team wanted to do. And so we started putting a heavy emphasis in exploring Power BI. And so we ended up doing that for a bit before we um, actually ended up getting a power internal Power BI resource, which was the key trigger to us solving the Power BI like sort of mystery there. Um, but we did work with Velocio to get Power BI stood up, connected to dynamics and get get us kickstarted and then once we had our internal resource it like it immediately like took off from there and it was, so it was a little bit of that before we really jumped head first into um into your erp into into looking at business central and i assume again you just picked dynamics dc that's the answer no. for your gsp <laughs> <laughs> no it was not um it, i mean it worked it worked out perfectly but um you know, so somewhat similar situation of, we, you know, like we very much wanted to, to be a fair game. I think at that point in my mind, initially I wasn't sure because Business Central, I can't remember the year, the years are blurring, but I know Business Central was relatively new when we, like when we, when, and partially like by delaying us going to it, it, it worked out because Business Central became ready for us to, to jump to. Um, because if it wasn't Business Central, I strongly doubt we would have went to Microsoft because I feel that their solutions prior to Business Central didn't fit us as an organization. Um, and I say that in the sense that, like we as a firm, you know, at this point we had grown to about a hundred staff. So, you know, still a small mid-sized firm, but the way we handle a lot of our finances was very similar to firms much, much larger than us. Um, and one of the things that I discovered very quickly in looking at the marketplaces for, for you know similar ERP systems is that you have ones that are big. You have your you know your Oracles, your SAPs, you know your your old school Great Plains and all the old Microsoft legacy um, platforms, or you have things like Sage 50 and and like small mom and pop, like um, small like systems that are aimed for mom and pop shops or like independent contractors and so forth. And that middle ground is shockingly not well serviced in 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 in, in in the industry uh, until Business Central came around, like there, in, in, in many ways. So, you know, when we started looking at systems, like we, you know, we kicked the tires again at NetSuite, but we kind of knew at that point, since we didn't clearly didn't go CRM with NetSuite, that it really didn't make, it wouldn't make much sense to be like, oh, we went Microsoft here and let's go NetSuite because that would just create more problems in the long term. Um, so for us, it ended up becoming Microsoft Business Central because it seemed to fit perfectly into what we wanted to do. And so so this time around, in my mind, that was my personal front runner. Um, but the other, and we also looked at two other firms, again, one other boutique one, and then we looked at Sage, of course, has their own suite of products, and they, they had one that was also cloud-based and aimed at a similar you know market or industry size as us. So it, it became down to those three, and then the boutique one fell out very quickly, and it was really between Sage and Business Central. And here, in many ways, Microsoft just won out by sheer simplicity of cost, um, and, 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 and just like straight cost, period, both simplicity and just straight cost, because Microsoft was just like, how many users do you have? This is what we're gonna charge, and that is pretty much it. Um, and it was very inexpensive per user. Whereas Sage had like, there was an, a charge for the, the engine, there was a charge for the reporting piece, there was another charge for this. And then there was like these licensing charges on top of that. And then it was 
it was like shocking to me. It was like an order of magnitude more expensive than um, than Microsoft, to, and so it was an absolute no brainer because functionally they did the same thing. So we knew like from an implementation, you know, at least you know roughly implementation should be roughly the same, but our licensing on Microsoft would be you know a fraction, absolute fraction of what we would have had to pay Sage for the same thing. And, and um, you mentioned that your current ERP was doing the job. It was right. it was getting things done. Um, so moving to BC, awesome. There's there's savings there, or it's not that much more expensive. It sounds like. Yeah, it Did wouldn't. You, it wasn't going to be a savings based on Sage 50, but nothing would have been. Yeah, to, it's for your next iteration. Good point. Um, yeah. Beyond that. Did you get anything additional that that maybe you were looking for? Because again, your product, to, you know, at that time was getting the job done. Did you get anything in on top of just the day to day operations? Did well, Lorna the, find some magic thing that you know you guys were like, oh, I really want that? <laughs> <laughs> well, can we go with cloud based? Yeah. So I mean, they, it, all of a sudden, there's no servers anymore. Right. Everything's up there in the cloud. You also ended up with when when PSA was up and running and BC is up and running. You have a, a highly sophisticated integration between the two products. Yep. That's that's updating your financial system. It's keeping your CRM system in in line. And I mean that, that's pretty significant. I know you had it with Sage, but what you got in the end is probably five times better than you had. It's way better. It's 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 just yeah. No, it's. It's the difference between like a like a country road between <laughs> like a dirt country road between Sage and and and, uh, and Dynamics versus a super highway that runs between uh, BC and, and, and CRM. Yeah, and when we did this deployment, it was also 2020, so it was it was the height of COVID. It was there was a lot of stress, and mm -hmm. people were working from home. So being able to do that implementation the way my team does it, all very remote, is was was a blessing, but also probably a big challenge to your team. It was a huge challenge for our finance team because until COVID, our finance team of all the teams was the one that was by far always in the office, always sitting together in their pod, always working together. And um, suddenly they're all split up, you know, working from home. And even and, and and so for them, just getting used to the new work dynamics was hard. Um, and so, you know, for them to keep up with their day to day job. In many ways, was you know, it, it, for them, some of them, for some of them, it was a challenge just to to adjust. And then, oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> we still need you to like, you know, give feedback to Lorna's team, and then eventually UAT, and you know, double check this. And they're like, I just want to, you know, like I just need to make sure I'm paying invoices, or I need to make sure I'm doing this or that, and and um, you know, and then, so there there was there was definitely that curve um, for them to get through on top of it. So we definitely it, this one. You know the, the project did get delayed because of that because our, our not because of anything that that lorna or velasio did but just simply like our team just needed more time to get reacclimated to to everything reacclimated um, and andy we did change the scope and the the style of the project because we went in with an idea of of the modules we we're going to deploy and how it was going to work and and once we got in there we put the brakes on and said, this, this isn't right. It's not the right. right, you know, whatever module, it's not the right tool. We have to go back. And thankfully you were there to keep the, the your team motivated. And, um, it, you know, goes back to your change management skill where you, you kept them focused on the end result yeah. and collaborating with us and, and telling us what they really needed. So, right. Cause this is, actually, yeah, this is actually, that's a great point because one of the things that through my experience you discover is that Folks that have done their job for a very long time, they'll often they'll give the requirements. They'll be like, "I need to do A, then I need to do B, and then I need to do C." And then you, and then the you know the person takes those requirements and they try to build the system to do A, B, and C. Um, when the question should be, "What is your end goal? Like, what are you trying to accomplish?" Oh, I need to produce an invoice that has these fields. Okay, so technically you don't have to do A, B, or C. You just need this end product of an invoice that has these things. So instead of doing A, B, and C, you're now gonna do you're gonna swipe left and 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 do this instead, and it'll be faster. And you do that. Um, and part of the challenge is sometimes folks are so set in their ways, like I can't swipe left. I have to do A, B, and C. And it's like, but you know, and then it's working with them. That muscle memory. 
yeah, yeah. And, and but it's also just working with them to understood you know they, they they want to be heard they want you know they want to feel like they're they're understood and you and they and, and eventually you get them around to understanding like the end goal is you need to produce this by this period um this by that period and you need to have this and the data has to be accurate so those are the things that are that are important the physical steps that you do can change a million different ways and hope and, and our goal is that if they do change they're going to change for the better it'll be easier um and easier meaning less steps not that you're not used to it like so you know and it's getting to understand that like it may look different it may have different colors the fields may be arranged a little differently or you know the steps you do are different but that doesn't mean it's bad or it doesn't mean it's not meeting your requirements um, and that was that was a lot of like what Lorna was implying was that that was a lot of discussions that I was having with the finance team about it. And one of the nice things of doing dynamics first with Erica was that they had seen how it worked and they saw that it did work. Because I, I, I do feel that if had we done this first, there would have been a lot more distrust and a lot more stress about believing in the believing in the process. And the, yeah, but. Um, dealing with yeah absolutely but because they, they they saw erica's team like do the literally the same thing and they were very happy with their souls and not directly with them but they just knew that this this is what happened and they were like well that worked like because because one of their first questions that like one of our one of our finance folks will almost always ask well how did this work in dynamics and then i'll be i would be like well this is what we did with with erica's team and she's like okay okay and then and I think that's important to call out. These are two different teams, Lorna and Erica's team. I mean, they they have their focus areas, but again, you know, the user experience is incredibly important. And just to your point, Andy, they saw success the first time around. You know, it is another set of people, but they have that trust. And guess what? It delivered just like the first group of people. So I know we're almost at time, so I don't want to rush through this. But I do want to take a moment to talk about uh, the end, right? We we got we got past the urgency of getting off the sales force. You took an opportunity to reevaluate your ERP solution. You know, basically, um, what were the lessons learned? I think you hit on that, so there might not be a lot there. But you know, how did this partnership work out for GSG? Um, was it what you were looking for? Did the organization? you know, meet the needs, uh, get their needs met in regards to a total solution in this endeavor that you've gone through over years? And, and what does that look like for GST for the future? I mean, I mean 100%. I mean, just, I mean, as a partner, you're basically everything that I want for, for a partner, because I can turn to Lauren, I can turn to Eric, I can turn to a number of other people, not, you know, not on this call from Blasio and, and ask questions and get answers and get answers in a way of people trying to solve what's ha what's what's wrong as opposed to you know sometimes you work with with like you know companies and and their their first thought is the bottom line or how I or how they can I can sell this to you or or how can I upsell or anything else and here everything has been about like let's figure out how to solve the problem whatever the problem may be and some of it is pretty you know is pretty pretty simple and some of it gets more complex um but the but the but things are always like let's figure out how to solve it and i have some some of my best brainstorming discussions with like with you know people from Velocia. like so and, and some of it spans well beyond the realm of microsoft dynamics like it may start there and next thing you know we're talking about stuff that like you know that are that's it related that isn't even necessarily your wheelhouse or anything else, but we get into these in-depth discussions and we come up with these great ideas. And then and then it gets me to the point where like, I try to figure out like, how can I use you guys in this as opposed to you guys trying to sell me on how to, you know, how can we like sell you more oh, business? Right. Strategy session. Oh, that's great. How, how does that yeah. work? With our I mean, I mean, Raihan knows this, like we've, we've had, you know, discussions where it's just about like general IT strategy and structure and stuff. And it's been great, like for, for you know, from both ends, like I get a lot out of it. I'm sure he does too. Um, and, um, you know, and with others that are, that aren't on this call, we have these discussions about, you know, how, you know, how can we move things, you know, forward? What's, what are, what is that next step? Like sometimes I don't know any more than you do. Um, and so I just want to like throw some darts at the board and see how people react as to, yeah, I think that will work or no, Andy, that's absolutely crazy. Go, go through that again. 
How do you feel like all of this has set up GSG for the future? I mean, you you came in to an organization many moons ago. You you saw some areas of opportunity. The leadership has some area of opportunities. End users has had areas of opportunity. It seems like you've tackled a good chunk of that. How is GSG, GSG set up for the future now based on all that you've done thus far? I mean, I feel like GSG is set up very well for the future. I mean, we have we have a platform that at the moment we're very happy with. Um, it, it gets the work done. It is scalable and expandable to at least all the things that we can currently foresee. So, so taking into account like things that we can or any dramatic changes in the business and anything else. But, you know, and that's kind of what you, the best that you can hope for for any system is that if you presume business as usual or presume everything that you kind of project could happen and, and the systems that you have can help you meet those, you're in a great place. And, and I genuinely feel like, and this time I will say knock on wood, that we are in a, a, in a very good place that, that, you know, that, you know, for, for the last year and even this year, a lot of our, a lot of the areas that I've been focusing on for like improvement are more incremental improvement. Um, or areas that are just things, new things that we're trying to do as a firm, um, as opposed to coming back and doing an overhaul like we did when I first got, like, there's no plans to, you know, overhaul any of these systems like we did with Salesforce or with any of the legacy systems that I inherited when I first got here. Um, everything My that we're- innovate. Is, Now you're in the innovate phase where you're looking for, you know, what new, what next, what, exactly. is there an opportunity here? Not just let's fix, and improve here. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, I know we're at time. I don't want to cut anyone off. Does anyone else have any feedback on GSG and all that they've gone through in this? Essentially, this is what it is. It's a modernization project. You, Andy came in and again, there was an opportunity to modernize and set up GSG, not only for today's, uh, you know, needs and, and requirements, but now he's at the point where now that it can look forward and look at what else can GSG do? What areas of opportunity can they expand with? Any feedback, Erica, Lorna, Raihan? I'm just gonna echo the Andy, the change management, your ability to, and this is both sides, the ability to collaborate because we had to collaborate. And I'm sure Erica, during your project too, you had, there was a lot of collaboration is because we may have had, a, we may have thought we had a vision from Velocio. And GSG is like, you guys just don't quite get it. It's sitting down at the table and, and listening, and then also coming to, a, to an agreement that makes sense that GSG can say, yes, that will work. And Velocio says, yeah, we can do this work and it will, yep. and it will be successful. There won't be any backlash six months from now. Right. I, I, listening is, the, I think, is a key word, like from, from both sides is, is not, not sticking to your own agenda or what you have in your head, but listening what the, truly listening to what the other side is saying. All right, everyone, that was an interesting journey. What did you think? Change can be hard, there's no doubt about it. But when done right, digital transformation can lead to a competitive advantage. Let's not forget, it's not just the organization that it's affecting, it's also the people within it. Stay tuned throughout this season. We have so much more for you as we help clarify some of the complexities of digital transformation. In our next episode, we will offer a pragmatic guidance for planning and navigating a digital transformation journey. As we have learned today, there's no such thing as a one size fit all strategy when it comes to digital transformation. We'll discuss how to know if your company is ready for this change, what the best practices are, and how to map out the process in accordance with your business initiatives and ROI. It's a lot to cover, but we're gonna break it down step-by-step step to make sure you have a clear picture of the process. Digital transformation will modernize your business for today and set up your organization for the future, positioned for continued growth and success. Until next time, this is your host, Carolyn Norton.